Good morning and welcome. My name is Coral Owen. It's my pleasure to welcome you once more to today's session. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator for OneUp, formerly known as the Military Families Learning Network. Today we'll be discussing assessing malnutrition in the adult population and the role of the RDN. In case you're joining us for the first time, I'd like to give you a brief tour of our webinar platform so you can find your way around. Hopefully you're currently able to view the slides we're sharing. If you are unable to see them or have any other technical difficulties today, you can send us a tech support request via email to contact at oneop.org. I'll place this email address in the chat pod momentarily for your convenience. We do look forward to having you join us in the chat pod today for conversation and questions as well as hellos. To embed the chat so you don't miss any links or conversation, simply place your cursor over the shared slides. You should then see a toolbar pop up across the bottom of your screen, and then from there you can select the chat bubble icon. When typing your comments and questions, please be sure to select everyone from the response options drop down menu so everyone's able to view your comments and questions as they come through the chat. Note that the slides and resources for today's session are available for download on the event page. We'll also be covering the continued education information at the end of today's session. So if you're interested in those opportunities, please stay tuned till the very end. We're pleased to introduce you to our new name, OneOp. Thank you for joining us as we continue our partnership with the Department of Defense and the US Department of Agriculture to expand readiness, knowledge, and networks of the professionals supporting military service members and their families. At this time, it's my pleasure to turn things over to my colleague, Robin Allen, with the One Up Nutrition and Wellness team to introduce today's presenter. Robin. Thank you, Coral. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce Julia McQueen, registered dietitian. Uh, Julia is an inpatient clinical dietitian with six years of experience at two level one trauma centers in North Carolina. She has gained significant experience and training in the nutrition focused physical exam and its application to malnutrition diagnoses. She has also developed hand, a hands on training experience and competency for 40 dietitian department. I will now turn it over to Julia. All right, thank you for that, that warm welcome. So this topic is near and dear to me. So I will try to, I'll try to rein in how verbose I can be on this topic so that we finish on time. Um, so just to go over the learning objectives. Um, so what we're gonna talk about today, we're gonna focus on assessment and diagnosis of malnutrition, mostly from an inpatient lens. Um, however, much of what we're talking about is also gonna be relevant and applicable to other settings. So we're gonna talk about the prevalence and identification of malnourished patients in clinical populations. We're gonna discuss the registered dietitian's role in particular in the prevention and treatment of malnut malnourished patients. We're also gonna apply the AND Aspen malnutrition criteria uh, looking at some case studies. And we're going to talk about key components of the nutrition focused physical exam and some perceived barriers in its utilization. But first, I'd like to start off with a poll. Um, so I'd love to hear. And, and you should see a pop up on your screen. Um, but if you don't, you feel free to answer in the chat box. Uh, how often are you having discussions with the interdisciplinary team about malnutrition? Hardly ever, monthly, weekly, on the daily? And we'll give you a few seconds to answer. Okay, so it looks like uh, the biggest chunk of us uh, are saying hardly ever, uh, a third monthly, about 23% weekly, and then about 10% on the daily. Okay, yeah, so we have a good mix here of answers. So hopefully uh, by the end of this presentation, uh, maybe we'll, we'll, um, we'll see if we can increase those discussions a little bit. 
Okay, so let's start at the very beginning. Now I know everyone attending probably already knows what malnutrition is, but it's good to go ahead and just start with, with some definitions. So malnutrition, it can be under or over nutrition, but for the purposes of a clinical diagnosis of malnutrition, um, we're talking about undernutrition, which is defined as an adequate intake of protein and or energy over prolonged periods of time. It can lead to, uh, to evidence on a physical exam and loss of fat stores or muscle wasting, which is why the nutrition focused physical exam is such an important part of our assessment. Um, and reasons for malnutrition can vary. It can be starvation related, chronic disease related, or acute disease or injury related malnutrition, which we'll talk about a little later. We know as nutrition professionals that prevention and treatment of malnutrition in the hospitalized setting can improve overall quality of care, it can improve clinical outcomes, and it can reduce costs both for the patient and for the hospital. So looking at some statistics about malnutrition, it's estimated that the prevalence of malnourished hospitalized patients is between 30 and 50%. So there's some wide variability here, and that really depends on the setting and the criteria used. So an urban hospital is going to have a different patient population than a small hospital in a rural setting. So that's why there's some variability in this number. Um, the Healthcare Cost and Utilization Project um, looks at coded diagnoses in hospitals in the United States, and it comes out every few years uh, with this data. So the latest is from 2018, and it showed that 8.9% of hospital stays in the United States included a coded diagnosis for malnutrition. So this was an increase from the data from 2013 and then which was also increased from the data from 2010. Um, and part of that big jump from 2010 to 2013 can probably be accounted for because of the Aspen A&D criteria that came out in 2012. So we had the standardized criteria to follow. But you can see there's a big gap between what's estimated as far as the prevalence of malnutrition versus what is actually being coded. So what's the relevance of this? What's the relevance of malnutrition to a hospitalized patient? So according to that 2018 HCUP data, compared to patients who are not malnourished, uh, patients who are malnourished, it, for patients who are malnourished in hospital mortality is nearly three and a half times higher. Length of stay is nearly twice as long. They're twice as likely, more likely to discharge to another facility than to go straight home. They're nearly one and a half more times uh, likely to need home health services when they do go home. And they're nearly one and a half times more likely to be readmitted within 30 days. They also carry a higher economic burden, both for hospitals and for the patients themselves. So malnutrition continues to be underdiagnosed. Why does this actually matter? What's the significance of this? Approximately a third of patients who are not malnourished on admission may become so during their hospitalization. So it's important that we acknowledge this and that we capture it in the medical record. When we diagnose malnutrition, it makes it a priority. So it's in the medical record, it's on the hospital problem list as a medical issue that needs attention, that needs to be addressed, and it's going to be in the patient's past medical history. Um, it, a diagnosis of malnutrition, when it's present, it prioritizes appropriate nutrition interventions. And we know that nutrition interventions are low risk and cost effective. So how do we address malnutrition? Now, in some settings, nutrition care and interventions are siloed. So they're under the sole responsibility of the dietitian, when in actuality, it requires the support of the whole team, the interdisciplinary team, in order to be effective. Um, in the literature, it's, it says, or in some, in some parts of the literature, it says that RD recommendations are implemented in only about 42% of cases. Now, this is going to vary according to what setting you are, the, the culture of where you work, inpatient, outpatient, the specific unit or team that you're working with. Uh, this isn't necessarily across the board, but it is uh, a, a glaring number. It's a, it's a scary number for us as nutrition professionals. 
Um, in many care environments, provider sign-off is required for all or many of nutrition interventions. So including multiple disciplines and nutrition care in those nutrition interventions is really important in order to successfully prevent and treat malnutrition that's present. So creating a culture where nutrition is valued is really, really significant. So not only are we making sure to identify and diagnose malnutrition, but we also want to identify and monitor those that who are at risk. We want to prevent them from becoming malnourished. Um, and we want to, you know, continue to monitor, monitor them while they're in the hospital and then on after they discharge. So part of, of what we're doing to address malnutrition is implementing comprehensive nutrition interventions, be it PO, enteral nutrition, TPN, and develop a comprehensive discharge nutrition care and education plan. So that may involve multiple disciplines. So identifying and addressing malnutrition is a multidisciplinary effort. So starting with nursing, uh, nursing care, uh, nurses typically complete that nutrition screen on admission within 24 hours. And they're at the bedside helping implement nutrition recommendations. They may be encouraging PO intake. They may be encouraging supplement intake. They are uh, turning on the enteral nutrition pump. They are hanging the TPN bags. They are answering questions at the bedside first from the patients. Um, then we have case management. Uh, who connects patients to community resources as needed. They connect patient to outpatient services or, uh, or discharge resources such as that home health care, such as that discharging to another facility. Providers can you know, consult nutrition services at any time, consult the RD if they see something that concerns them. They, when a malnutrition diagnosis is made, they're the ones who are actually adding it to the problem list and often signing off on the nutrition care plan. Coders uh, review the medical record, make sure it adequately reflects the patient experience. They're looking in our notes to make sure that all the pieces to the puzzle to, identif to identify and document malnutrition are there so that it can be correctly coded for. There's other healthcare pro professionals of course, who are involved in the care of a malnourished patient. So speech language pathology, physical therapy, occupational therapy, the, the things that they are doing with patients are also important to help improve uh, nutrition status. And then of course, there's dietitians kind of leading the charge for this, assessing for malnutrition. We're, we're gathering the evidence for the malnutrition supportive criteria. We're identifying what level of malnutrition a patient meets. We are discussing that with the rest of the team. We're implementing nutrition care plans, hopefully with the support of the rest of the team. So we're really driving this. So to go a little bit more deeply into the registered dietitian scope of practice, wanted to focus here on how it includes the nutrition focused physical exam. So this may include both visual and physical examination. So really laying hands on a patient when possible is going to show us things. It's going to reveal to us things that we may not um, easily see. Um, and this, this little uh, quotation is directly from the 2017 standards of, of practice. Um, so we're looking at specific things on our physical exam that may or may not be included in the nurse's physical exam or in a provider's physical exam. So it's still important for us to do our own um, so that we can you know, take what we're getting from the nutrition focused physical exam in, in combination with the nutrition history we're getting either from the patient, from family members, from the medical record, and differentiate what is normal, what is not normal for, for this patient. Um, and then assessing and intervening when the findings are relevant to a patient's care, when, when there's something that we need to, maybe some labs we need to order, maybe some nutri nutrition interventions we need to um, we need to start, and then we're going to refer back and collaborate to the interdisciplinary team. 
So where does malnutrition fit into the nutrition care process? So that nutrition screening occurs within 24 hours of admission. So this is a requirement by Joint Commission, which started in 1996. Um, so for a good long while now, we've had we it's been a requirement for hospitals to do nutrition screening within 24 hours. Um, and there's several different validated screening tools that can be used for this. This is just uh, three that I've, I've picked out. These are three common ones. Um, and ideally, a screening tool is going to be easy to use and relatively quick to use. So typically just a few questions um, that normally, a, I would say, normally a nurse at the bedside is completing this screening tool within 24 hours. Um, and then during our assessment phase, that's really where we're getting to the meat of what's going on with this patient. So maybe we've been screened because of poor intake or because of weight loss. Uh, so we're going in to see the patient, a, a, a trigger is put in, a, a dietitian goes and sees the patient, and we assess whether or not they meet criteria for malnutrition, then we document our findings. We implement appropriate interventions. And of course, there's monitoring that we're going to be doing so that we can make sure that their nutrition status is improving or not worsening. Okay, so those nutrition interventions, like I mentioned before, they're low risk, they're cost effective. Uh, we know that they lower mortality rates, they uh, lower length of stay, they lower the cost for the patient, they are associated with lower readmission rates, uh, a reduced risk of falls, and reduced complications, so reduced infections, reduced pressure ulcers, reduced DVTs, and there's a lot of data out there that looks at specific populations and nutrition interventions, maybe enteral nutrition or TPN, and, and looking at them even more specifically to look at what are the outcomes happening from nutrition interventions. Uh, so someone is asking, do you need to get permission from your facility before you start doing the nutrition focused physical exam, or at least notify that you will be doing this? Um, no, it's part of our uh, scope of practice as registered dietitians. So it's not something that we need to specifically receive permission from. Um, you know, it's, it's not a procedure where like where a patient's going to have to sign their consent or anything. Um, so maybe letting your team know, hey, this is part of my practice. Um, I've undergone such and such training. This is a part of my scope of practice. It might be good uh, to have that discussion just so that uh, they have a good understanding of what you can do and, and what you're able to do and uh, how awesome you are as a nutrition professional, but no specific permission isn't really necessary since it's part of our scope of practice. So Julia, since you're kind of at a pause here, there's sure. a couple other questions. Yeah. Um, Beth asks, is there any data on the effects of malnutrition in home care, impact of hospital readmission or any info? I work in home care and rarely see it coded upon discharge from acute care. Okay, that's a good question. Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but I'm happy to look into that and see if I can find any literature about that. Um, I, I, I think with as far as it being diagnosed and coded it, so that information like translates into the home care setting or I think it really depends on the healthcare system and their process for documenting. Um, so some so for the healthcare system I work for currently, we have outpatient dietitians and home care dietitians that are a part of the network. So they are, whenever we I put a malnutrition diagnosis on a patient in the inpatient setting, then they're alerted um, on the outpatient side. Um, so it's, it's um, I think it very much depends on the, the healthcare system. And then what about hospitals not licensed through joint commission? Are there other accreditation agencies that require assessment? Uh, require assess, require like the nutrition screen? Yeah. Yes, I think. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how that, how that works. I would have to look into that as well. Okay. And Teresa says, be sure it is included in the job description. 
Yeah, for the that's a good point, Therese. The, the uh, nutrition focus physical exam should be part of the job description. Absolutely. Great. Okay. Thank you. All right. So now that we have a general background on malnutrition and hospitalized patients, we're going to talk about uh, the Aspen A&D criteria for malnutrition that was created in 2012. And Aspen is American Society of Perineal and Enteral Nutrition, and then of course A&D Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. So. This criteria was created in response to an identified need in part by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, but also for members of these two organizations to have standardized criteria in which to identify patients as malnourished. So we had these malnutrition codes, but we needed a standardized way of assessing patients for malnutrition. And it's now widely used throughout the United States for the diagnosis of malnutrition. So first that nutrition risk is identified. So either through a nutrition screen or maybe a verbal consult or an a, you know, official consult put in to the, to the medical record. Um, and then we use an etiology-based approach, which involves assessing the patient for, for inflammation. So is inflammation present? If it is, is it a marked inflammatory response or is it inflammation of a mild to moderate degree? And we're gonna talk more about, about this in a moment. Um, so if it's a marked inflammatory response, it's gonna point more to an acute disease or injury-related malnutrition. If it's mild to moderate degree, going to be more pointing to that chronic disease related malnutrition. And if there's no inflammation present, then it's going to be more of that, that pure, purely starvation related malnutrition. And we'll talk about examples and, and how to get to that in a moment. So it's well understood that inflammation is an underlying factor that increases risk for malnutrition. It increases the risk of worsening severity of malnutrition. And we know that there's a decreased response to nutrition interventions in acute conditions when there's that marked inflammatory response. So that high uh, or that, that increased amount of inflammation in an acute disease, such as someone admitted to the ICU in septic shock, they're going to be in, incredibly inflamed. Nutrition interventions, you know, starting at two feet, it's more about attenuating that inf inflammatory response rather than, you know, where we're giving all the calories that they need in that, in that moment. Um, and that marked increase in inflammation can potentially increase the risk of mortality. So inflammation it can be chronic or of chronic or acute degree. When it's chronic, it's more of that mild, moderate, prolonged, persistent inflammation. Uh, it lacks the classic signs of inflammation. Um, so examples of, of chronic where chronic inflammation may be present is um, in obesity and insulin resistance and obstructive sleep apnea. And we'll talk about more in a moment. Um, those classic signs of inflammation, though, are more present in the acute inflammation, where the inflammation is really, uh, really marked. So swelling, arrhythmia, hyperthermia, pain, you'll see a marked CRP elevation in their labs. And the whole purpose of that is your body is, the body is responding to, to send repair cells to, to clear the infection. I mean, there's a whole, that's a whole nother, a whole nother topic, but acute inflammation, it's supposed to be short term um, and, and really marked. And there's uh, very clear, obvious uh, clinical and laboratory signs there. Uh, someone's asking, or Mary, excuse me, is asking uh, dialysis patients, would they be considered chronic? Yes, absolutely. And I, I believe they're going to be in in a few slides listed as an example. Okay, so assessing for, for inflammation, um, there's no one parameter to verify that inflammation is present, um, but there is a group of measures, both laboratory as well as clinically demonstrated that we can look for. Um, so negative acute phase reactants decrease in the presence of inflammation. So that's our albumin, prealbumin, transferrin. There's others that are included in that, but those are the, kind of the three that we see most often in, in labs. Um, and I know that's a whole nother topic of how albumin and prealbumin are not uh, not great nutrition markers, at least in the uh, inpatient 
uh, setting, especially when there's a lot of inflammation because they are negative acute phase reactants. There's also positive acute phase reactants that increase in the presence of inflama inflammation, such as that CRP. Uh, there's several others as well, but CRP is, is the one that we see most often ordered uh, in a lab panel. Uh, you'll also see elevated blood sugar, a decreased or increased white blood cell count. You may see decreased platelets, marked negative nitrogen balance. Um, and on clinical presentation, signs of inflammation present, fever, hypothermia, infection, sepsis, UTI, pneumonia. Uh, if there's wound or especially an infected wound or infected surgical incision, and if the abscess is present, all of, all of those things are going to point to there's inflammation of some degree present here. So I have some examples here, and of course, this doesn't encompass everything that could um, be included. I'm sure that we can all think of examples that are not included on these slides, but here's just a few for acute illness and injury. Uh, could be major infection or sepsis, cardiac shock, septic shock, respiratory distress syndrome, syndrome burns, trauma, a closed head injury, any, any major surgery, especially one that involves a major organ, uh, there's gonna be inflammation that's acute and of severe degree in those cases. For chronic illness with mild moderate inflammation where it's it's inflammation that's always present, but not, not that marked inflammatory response. Um, examples are organ failure, so dialysis patients would be included here, cancer, heart disease, cystic fibrosis. The list can go on and on here with, with inflammation uh, associated to various disease states. And then our third etiology is social envi or environmental circumstances where it's chronic kind of, I, can, I, I call it like pure starvation without inflammation present. So examples are, you know, undernutrition because of economic hardship, because of food insecurity, because of maybe a diagnosis of dementia, uh, some sort of impairment that is preventing adequate nutrition intake. Um, an inability or lack of desire to manage self-care. Uh, anorexia nervosa would actually be included under here because it's it, there's not really a, uh, it's interesting, it's not really an inf inflammatory response with anorexia nervosa. I would say the caveat to that is if someone is admitted with anorexia nervosa and then they also have um, associ associated organ failure, such as heart failure, um, then that would be more of a, a chronic um, chronic disease related because there's going to be inflammation present in that case. Um, and then poor oral or dental conditions. So maybe they're having, they have poor attention, they have difficulty chewing and swallowing. They're now drink, mostly drinking their meals or doing liquid, um, liquid shakes and just not uh, getting in enough nutrition. Okay. So for a diagnosis of malnutrition, there need to be at least two categories of criteria present. So for a diagnosis of severe malnutrition, and the code is up there in the upper left-hand corner, there are six available. So weight loss, energy intake, uh, fat loss, muscle mass loss, fluid accumulation, and hand grip strength. Um, so for a few things that I want to point out with this table is that each etiology is listed here. They each have their own column. So we want to make sure not to mix up our criteria here, not to mix an acute weight loss with um, a chronic energy intake or, or something like that. Um, so we want to make sure that we're choosing our etiology first before we're trying to fit in our criteria into this box. Um, another thing I wanna point out is that each etiology, it's all under the same code. So the important thing here is to pick what makes sense for the clinical picture for your patient. So sometimes this requires, we can get into the nitty gritty of they have this 
percentage weight loss and but there's severe fat depletion over here and moderate over here how does this all fit together and sometimes we just need to take a step back and look at the big picture what are they telling us from their nutrition history what are we seeing on physical exam uh what's the overall uh, clinical picture, starting with etiology and then looking at what evidence you have for it. Okay, and then for moderate malnutrition, it's the same in, in that you, you have to have at least two categories present in order to have a diagnosis of malnutrition. Moderate malnutrition is a separate code from severe malnutrition, uh, but again, all the etiologies are under the same code. Uh, so you just have to pick what makes the most sense for your patient. Um, you'll notice that hand grip strength here is not included, so there's just five criteria available for moderate malnutrition. And hand grip strength, I, I, there's just not enough data to really be able to tease out uh, severe versus moderate. Okay. Oh, and one thing I did, I'm just going to go back here. One thing I did want to point out here for the areas of fat loss and muscle mass loss is that it doesn't... Uh, stipulate how many areas on physical exam need to have loss in order it, for it to count as criteria. So uh, we'll get to that a little bit later on when we're talking about nutrition focused physical exam, but it really just is up to your clinical judgment for if it is sufficient to say muscle mass meets criteria, for example. Uh, sorry. Julia, Mary or, yeah, wants sure. to know, a lot of my dialysis patients do not brush their teeth as they should and have not mm -hmm. been to the dentist in a long time. Does that contribute to their inflammation if they may have cavities, other dental conditions aside from just missing teeth? hope that makes sense. Oh, that's a great question. Um, yes, I, I would assume that there would be infect, uh, inflammation present if there's uh, infect, infection present. Um, so I'd say you'd have to make your best judgment with what's going on. You know, a lot of times they, there may be some dental disease and then they're admitted for teeth extraction. Um, and through that whole process, the inflammation might be down a little bit after the surgery. And then they're just having issues with chewing and swallowing. I don't know. It just kind of depends on, on what you're seeing with the patient at the time that you're assessing them. Uh, and that's why I, I hope it's reassuring too, that if you're not sure if it's chronic versus uh, social environmental is that it is the same malnutrition code. So if you're not sure what, which one it is, um, I, I always say when, when people ask me, is this moderate versus severe, I have a mix of criteria here, or I'm not sure if there's inflammation or if, it, if there's not. Um, I, I just say, well, what, what makes sense to you? If someone were, were to argue the point to you, what do you feel comfortable uh, making an argument for? Um, and as long as you have the supporting criteria to support your diagnosis, to support your context that you're using, then I think that, you know, whatever your clinical judgment tells you is correct, is, is correct. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the nutrition-focused physical exam. Uh, and I do wanna make the point here so that I'm, I'm going over what's included in the nutrition-focused physical exam, but this by no means is a replacement for a, a full like hands-on training for the nutrition-focused physical exam. So Aspen and A&D both have great uh, trainings, lots of resources available uh, on this exam. So this is just more of a brief overview of what's all, what's included. So let's start by some discuss some discussion in the chat pod. Uh, what barriers do you come across in utilizing the nutrition focused physical exam with your patients? Because I know we're we're coming from a lot of different settings, probably here. Yeah, feel free to type your answers in the um, chat pod.
And thank you, to Therese, for your um, suggestion for our article about inflammation by Gordon Jensen. We can try to uh, include that in the resources. Okay, so I'm seeing a lot of time barriers, uh, mobility restrictions, pain control, COVID isolation precaution, absolutely, in the last couple years, agitation or agitated combative patients, in video sessions, so more telehealth, uh, not being able to you know, visualize fully your patient. Um, let's see. For others, feeling extremely ill, not a minimal to exam, giving acuity of illness. Sure, time constraints in the schedule, confu confused people, psychiatric patients that can be unpredictable. Let's see, patients with paralysis, when and when not to include the muscle loss because some is expected case by case basis. That's an excellent point. All right. Let's see. Patients with leg braces or wound vax, interruption by other staff or limited time, heavy clothing, um, guessing that's from an outpatient setting. Uh, colleagues who don't feel adequately trained or comfortable doing the nutrition-focused physical exam. Yeah, so there's a lot of different reasons. There's a lot of different barriers to doing a physical exam. Um, and I think y'all have hit everyone that I've, every single one that I've come across as well. Um, so yeah, part of the reason that me and a colleague of mine uh, created a nutrition focused physical exam training and competency at our hospital was because we came across the same thing where we had a department with dietitians of varying levels of experience with the exam uh, coming from different settings, from different backgrounds, from different uh, educational focuses. So we wanted to have a training that was available to everyone um, regardless of experience and a competency going forward that they can complete on a yearly basis, uh, basically to improve confidence uh, in their ability to use a nutrition focused physical exam and to discuss these common uh, barriers that, that come up. Um, so thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. Okay. So just to go over some areas, the first being subcutaneous fat loss. So there's four areas to assess here, orbital fat pads, the buckle fat pads, the cheeks, uh, the triceps or the middle upper arm, and the ribs or the mid axillary line. And of course, a lot of times when we're doing a physical exam and y'all mentioned a lot of reasons for barriers, I have rarely been able to assess every single area there is to assess on a physical exam. So sometimes, uh, you know, we can do an upper exam, but not a lower exam, or we can do one side, but not the other um, for various reasons that y'all, that you have already listed. Uh, but for subcutaneous fat, we're looking at fat pads that are under the skin, usually covering a bony prominence or a muscle, which is why we have some, you know, triceps and ribs listed. And we know that triceps is not a, is not fat, it's a muscle, but it's, it's our landmark that we use to accurately assess for that fat pad that lays over it. We're gonna look for looser hanging skin because that's gonna tell us that there's been some losses there. Um, it could be age related. Some of y'all talked about uh, geriatric patients being a barrier, just not knowing the context of, of the muscle loss that you're seeing. So it could be age related or it could be because of muscle loss or uh, weight loss that, you know, is not age related. Um, we're also want to keep that in mind when we're doing the pinch test. So for the triceps and the ribs areas, we're doing the pinch test where we're assessing the space between fingers when you're pinching. And if any of you got into bread baking during your COVID uh, quarantine, then you'll know what I mean when I say it should feel like bread dough. So it should be malleable, but having some resistance when you are pinching. And of course, when, when I say pinching, I don't mean causing pain to the patient, uh, but more of a, of a gentle squeezing. So if it was really severe, you would feel in a pinch, you'd feel like you could feel your your fingers nearly touching in that pinch. There's not much space. Whereas 
Um, if someone was well nourished, there'd be a good thick fat pad um, that you're pinching where you'd get that that bread dough consistency feeling. All right, for muscle loss, there's a lot more areas to assess for muscle loss. We have the temple muscle, we have the pectoralis, the muscle around the clavicle, the deltoid or the shoulder muscle. We have the interosseous muscles, which are on the back of the hand or in between the, the thumb and pointer finger when you do an okay sign. We have the group of muscles that are difficult for me to pronounce around the shoulder blade. We have the quadriceps and the patellar muscle and then the calf muscle, which is also difficult for me to pronounce. So I'm, I'm gonna avoid it. Um, so we're gonna, for muscle mass, we're gonna inspect and palpate for bulk and tone. So there, there should be firmness there, but some bounce and resistance when palpated. So for example, if you're, uh, feeling for the temple muscle and it just feels really hard and and bony, you might just be feeling the bone, which would which would tell us that there's not much muscle there. But for example, um, you can have them chew so that you can feel that muscle working and it might help you easier, e more easily assess. Um, and there's some great tricks for uh, assessing each of these areas, but again, uh, that's more in more detail in the hands-on training with the Aspen and A and D uh, trainings that they have available. You're going to look for prominent or protruding bones uh, for muscle atrophy, for bilateral versus unilateral muscle losses, which may point to, you, you know, muscle losses from uh, from a stroke, maybe they have muscle loss more on one side, or maybe from an injury. So we want to know the muscle changes in the context of what of the patient's nutrition history and what's currently going on with them. So sometimes we may have all that information and sometimes we may not. So we have to work with what we have, um, especially if a patient isn't a good historian or there's no family present to help us uh, kind of make sense of what we're seeing on physical exam. So y'all already talked about some non-nutrition related causes. So things we want to keep in mind are muscle losses that could happen from inactivity, from paralysis, from being bed bound, from a muscle wasting disease or peripheral nervous system disease. So these are all things that we want to keep in mind when we're, when we're doing our physical exam. So we can also assess for fluid accumulation. So providers and nurses are doing this as well. It's probably already in the medical record, but at least in my experience, I see a lot of variability between the provider and the nursing documentation a lot of times uh, regarding fluid accumulation. So it's always good to kind of double check. And then I ask the nurse, hey, did you get plus two on their lower, their lower extremity or, or something like that? Um, so with each plus one depth, it represents a two millimeter depression. Now we don't need to get out our rulers to measure that. It's more easily uh, uh, practiced by looking at the time it takes for that depression to rebound. Um, so plus three, plus four, it's going to take quite a while to rebound. I've, I've had patients with plus four where it took well over 20 seconds, maybe over a minute or two uh, to fully rebound. Now, of course, there may be weeping edema present. Um, and in that case, that's pretty severe already. Edema can also be quite painful for some patients. So you always want to ask the question either to the patient or to the nurse if they can't answer, if, if you can assess those areas so that you're not causing them pain. One thing we want to keep in mind with fluid accum accumulation is that it's going to affect how we assess for weight loss. So we, it's going to make it more difficult to assess uh, for accurate, accurate weight loss. Um, we also want to keep in mind that just because fluid accumulation is present does not mean it's necessarily a sign that a patient is malnourished. So patients with lymphedema, patients with heart disease, maybe they're coming in and they're eating really well, their weight's gone up and down because of fluid going up and down. And there's a lot of fluid accumulation on exam, but that's not necessarily mean going to mean that they meet malnutrition criteria because they're eating great. Their dry weight hasn't really changed. Um, and you're not seeing a lot of muscle or fat loss on exam. Uh, so the question to ask yourself is if this, if the fluid wasn't present, do I expect to see 
muscle and fat loss that's concerning for malnutrition. Um, so that's something to kind of ask yourself um, if you're kind of getting in the in the trenches with um, with thinking about fluid accumulation. Okay. And this last criteria for the nutrition focused physical exam is hand grip strength. And this is one that is probably the least often utilized because uh, it requires training, it requires uh, money and budget for the instruments themselves. And it's not a validated tool in the critically ill. It's actually pretty difficult to use in an inpatient setting. So probably better and more often used in the outpatient setting. Um, so it is a reliable method when standardized methods and calibrated tools are used. Reference ranges come with the tool and it's based on gender, age, and which hand is being used. So to meet malnutrition criteria for reduced hand grip strength, it needs to be two standard deviations below the mean, which is found using the reference guides that come with the instrument itself. Other ways to assess functional status, and this is important too when you're thinking about what you're finding in the physical exam, is to look at what PT and OT are saying, to ask the patient and family questions about functional status. It may be really helpful to put what you're finding on physical exam in perspective. So if you know a patient what used to ambulate with a cane, but then they were bed bound for the two weeks leading up to when you see them, then that's going to help you really put what you're finding for their lower extremities into perspective uh, if you know that they haven't uh, been very active. So it's not something that you can use for malnutrition criteria, but it's going to be helpful in your overall assessment. Okay, so that hand grip strength, this is just showing how um, if you have a two standard deviations below the mean using that hand dynamometer, then it's going to meet criteria for severe malnutrition and that it's not applicable to the moderate malnutrition diagnosis. Okay, so for documenting supportive criteria, what needs to be included? So we want to have all of our nutrition focused physical exam findings included. We want to have the evaluation or, or discussion of supportive criteria that points to the diagnosis. Uh, included in our um, documentation. And then we want to have a diagnostic statement that's going to include three specific things, the degree of malnutrition, the context, whether it's acute, chronic, or starvation environmental related, um, and the supportive evidence, which again, it needs to be at least two areas of criteria. So this is an example I just kind of pulled out of my hat for what a diagnostic statement could look like. Patient meets criteria for severe malnutrition, so including the degree here in the context of chronic illness, so including the context. And then it, as evidenced by, and I have here three supporting criteria, weight loss, energy intake, and muscle loss. Okay, so I think we're only going to have time for one quick case study. So just going to read this out really quickly and feel free to answer in the chat box as we go along. So a 64-year-old male was admitted with several weeks of poor intake, a month of worsening dysphagia, hoarseness, cough, nausea, vomiting, and some fevers. Past medical history includes heavy tobacco use, hypertension, coronary artery disease. There is a concern for malignancy on his presentation, and then he was found to have laryngeal cancer. Uh, here are some of his anthropometrics. So on admission, he weighed 165 pounds and he reported a usual body weight of about 190 pounds. So if you don't mind going ahead and calculating that percentage weight loss and sharing in the chat pod, 13%. That was fast, Vanessa. Awesome. Uh, the patient, so during this whole process, the the dietitian was uh, triggered to see them for poor intake. Um, they reported to the dietitian on their visit that they normally eat three meals a day. Now it's down to one small meal, an occasional snack or milkshake for over a month. Their intake changed to liquids in the past week due to that worsening dysphagia. And they've also had some intermittent nausea vomiting. So all of that is something to, to take into consideration when thinking about their energy intake. He did endorse waste, weight loss, but he doesn't really weigh himself at home. He thinks he is starting at about three weeks, three months, excuse me, prior to admission, unsure how much, though he was su surprised by that admission weight number. So what do y'all think for the energy intake? Is that 
would that be something that is severe or more moderate? Is it concerning? Severe. I agree, Kelly. <laughs> pretty, pretty severe. Went down to liquids only in that week beforehand. All right. So the dietitian hears all this and is like, I'm going to do a physical exam. Um, he's had a lot of weight loss. He has poor PO intake. They notice that the patient appears pale, fatigued, weak, uh, very low energy. And I know it's hard to kind of visualize this nutrition focused physical exam with words alone, but we're going to do the, do the best we can. Um, so looking at this, does this, does what you're reading on the screen for the different areas, does it point to a more severe or a more moderate picture? So for orbital, we have dark circles, there's obvious scooping to the temple, there's squaring of the shoulder, there's a protruding clavicle, um, there's noted depressions in the thigh, there's minimal definition in the calf. Yeah, Jessica, Donna, all saying severe, air on the side of severe, yeah. So most of these areas are severe. The two moderate areas are more of the, are two of the fat loss areas. So the scapula, that mild depression and the ribs being uh, somewhat apparent, depression somewhat in, pronounced, that, that's more describing a moderate, uh, a, a moderate loss rather than severe. All right, so for this patient with a new diagnosis of laryngeal, laryngeal cancer, is, would there be inflammation present? Yes. Yes, Suzanne. Yeah, Kelly. Yes, thank you. Um, and would it be a marked inflammatory response or more of a mild to moderate degree? Yes, always inflammation with cancer patients. Okay, sure. So I'm getting severe, I'm getting marked, I'm getting both. Okay, so these are, these are, gr okay, let's see, marked, mark, Kelly, you'd say, would say chronic. Yeah, so this uh, is interesting because on time, at, at the time of diagnosis, there probably is, um, you know, a diagnosis for something like this with prior to it being treated, there probably is some marked response. But when we're talking about a marked response, we're talking about that, um, really high CRP, which, which can happen in cancer patients for sure. Um, but really for, for this, I would go with more, oh, got to move my slides, more of that moderate degree, because this is a, a more of a chronic disease related malnutrition. So um, I agree that it would be more of a, in, the inflammation present would be more of a moderate degree. Okay. All right. So let's look at the, let's lay out the malnutrition criteria that we have. So we already mentioned we had 13% weight loss and it was severe. The energy intake was severe. The nutrition focused physical findings, most of those were severe, but we did have some moderate losses. Would this point to an overall moderate versus severe degree of malnutrition? Severe, yes. Absolutely. So let's look back at our table. Where does this all fit in? So we have four criteria. We're overachievers. Uh, we only need two, and there's four. Weight loss, energy intake, muscle loss, and fat loss. Um, so... Beth, you're asking, does it matter if it's the same code? So this is where I would say, let's take a step back and look at the big picture. Uh, what you're seeing on physical exam, you're seeing mostly severe depletion. Is that going to um, all be because of an acute issue? Probably not. It's been happening for quite a while. Um, he's had poor energy intake for well over a month, weight loss over three months. It's more of a, that chronic picture. So I would say this is the instance where you take a step back and see how it best fits. But you're right that since it is the same code, it wouldn't change the code. It would just kind of change what you're saying about your patient and your evaluation.
All right, so I know we have some questions. I'm just gonna go to the next slide and hopefully that will answer some. So here's an example of what this supportive diagnostic statement could look like. Patient meets criteria for severe malnutrition in the context of chronic illness. So it has those two things. And then the third thing, the supportive criteria. So we have the weight loss, the energy intake, the muscle loss and the fat loss. Now, I did say here that moderate fat and muscle loss is not included in the diagnostic statement because it doesn't fit into that severe malnutrition criteria, but you would still have it in your documentation under your physical assessment findings as part of your overall assessment. Okay. All right. So I'm getting some questions. What happens if we have a severe weight loss and the PO intake and muscle fat losses are all moderate? That's a great question. Um, oh, and, and then it continues. Or just one category, category is severe and the rest in, in moderate. So I would say go by what you have the most evidence for. If most of your evidence is pointing towards moderate, then go for moderate. You can still use that you know, severe weight loss, if that's included, and, and, and your, your moderate criteria. Um, I tend to, to go on this, the side of being conservative and going down to moderate uh, malnutrition in my diagnosis, but it all goes back to the big picture thinking. So what is, what is my overall assessment telling me about this patient? If someone were to argue, argue the point, if the coder was going to come back and, and audit my note and, and argue with me about it, um, or, or have, well, you know, pose some good questions to me about it, um, then what would I feel the most strongly about? Um, but if you have more, uh, more evidence for a moderate picture, then go to moderate. Let's so see. Julia, okay, this ahead, is a, uh, this is pretty, this is all fascinating. And <laughs> in the interest of time, we're yes. going to start uh, wrapping up. I am going to do, give you a quick question from YouTube though. Any tips sure. on utilizing the A and D Aspen malnutrition criteria in the bariatric surgery setting or the spinal cord injury setting, any literature on validation in these populations? I've struggled here. And then can you share your reference on standard deviations? We can write uh, the answers to this up in the, uh, in a blog post too, because this looks like a pretty detailed question. What what do you think would be easiest? Uh, yeah, I think I can uh, address it uh, written. Um, I will go ahead and say that I don't think that there is a validation for the physical exam in specific populations. Um, I can take a look, um, but I think it goes back to being able to differentiate what is normal versus what is not normal. Um, and a lot of that comes down to doing physical exams on a regular basis. Um, and especially if you're following a patient for a long time, um, especially in an outpatient setting, um, then you're going to know what's normal versus not normal for that patient as well. But we can go over those questions in more detail in, in written form. Great. And uh, the blog, it'll be on our, um, our website, the One Up Nutrition and Wellness will be posted there. And I'll also send it out via uh, email if you're on our email list. So Julia, this was fascinating. I have a lot of reading and work to do. I can tell. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. It was a great presentation. We're getting a lot of positive feedback. So we're going to move right along to some of the housekeeping details. So I'm uh, very pleased to uh, announce this upcoming event, Recent Advances in Sustainable Diets, Tuesday, April 19th at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. Continuing education, continuing education is available for this. Uh, all you have to do is go to the event page, uh, click on the purple evaluation link, complete the evaluation, you'll be directed to fill in your name and email. Uh, the, your, CPEU certificate will be emailed to you. Government addresses such as .mil and .gov frequently will not accept automated email, so you may want to use a personal email address. Any questions about your certificate, please contact Kristen DeFilippo at the one Op Nutrition Wellness Gmail account. Explore our upcoming events 
articles and resources and connect with one up. And Coral, I will turn it back up to you. Great, thank you so much, Robin. I wanna echo Robin's thanks to our wonderful speaker, Julia, for her time and expertise today, as well as for all the fantastic feedback, comments, and questions in the chat pod from our audience. So I did see we had a couple questions regarding upcoming events. So just a couple quick notes. So all of the resources that were mentioned today, including the slides, are available for download on the event page. So you can go back and access all of this information at your convenience. Additionally, today's session was also recorded. So if you'd like to go back and review any of the information presented today or share it out, that is going to be open access. And that recording will be posted to the event page as well within one to two business days. So if you have any questions beyond that, please don't hesitate to reach out to our team. Thank you again so much for joining us today. And we wish you a wonderful rest of your day. Take care and we'll see you soon.